Good morning again. I get to say good morning to you guys a couple of times. It's so good to be here with you. We are in this series called The Love Challenge, and this is the second Sunday, and there's so much to say about love. And so today the sermonic theme is Compassion Starters. Compassion Starters. A couple had two boys. One was eight years old and one was 10 and they were excessively mischievous. These two were always getting into trouble and their parents were bucking their heads on how to deter some of the behavior of these two little boys. It seems like they would encourage each other on. The parents were growing even more and more frustrated, but they learned about a pastor that was in town at a new church and they had heard that this pastor was really good at working with kids and helping kids to kind of change their behavior. So they reached out to the pastor and said, hey, can you, can you talk to our sons? They, they really are out of hand. And the pastor said, sure, I'll give it my best shot. And so the mother brought the two boys in and the pastor said, I, I'd love to talk to them uh, separately. I don't, I don't wanna talk to them both together. And so he took the youngest one, the eight-year-old in his office and he looked at the boys and said, have a seat. And he told him, where is God? And the boy looked at the pastor. He couldn't really think of what he should say back to this question. And so he remained silent. The pastor leaned in, thinking maybe the boy didn't hear or understand him, and spoke louder. Where is God? The boy thought to himself again, I don't even know what to say to that. And so he sat there and do what kids often do when they don't know what to do. He just stared at the pastor. The pastor raised his voice even louder this time and pointed his finger and said, son, where is God? This time the boy had enough sense to jump out of his seat, run out of the office and run home. His brother took his cue. He saw his brother running and so he decided to run with his brother as well. When they got home and they got to their room, the oldest brother said, hey, what did the pastor say to you? And the younger brother looked at him and said, we've, re we've really done it this time, and began to cry. The older brother said, come on, tell me, tell me what's wrong, I can help you out. And the younger brother said, God is missing, and they think we did it. Often blame gets placed at a lot of people's feet. On this particular day, the boys thought that blame had got placed on them. This cute, there's another cute little illustration and it shows a parent having a bad day. And that parent takes it out on the other spouse. And that spouse then takes it out on the oldest child. You know how this goes, right? And it just keeps cycling down until it gets all the way to the cat and the youngest kid kicks the cat. Blame is often something that gets shared and it gets spread around. In our government, there's blame. <laughs> Among the political parties, there's blame. In different groups that think differently, there's blame. Even how we look at understanding COVID, there's blame. Even in religion, there's blame. I was reading out on social media this one Christian in Nigeria saying, see, we don't have much COVID over here, why? because God is not mad at us. That implies that God is really mad at who? <laughs> Americans. Again, that is blame. And that's a bad theology. And that's a dangerous theology. Whether God is missing or whether God is mad, like a teenager who cannot get their clothes to the wastebasket, it seems like blame is all over the place. Our society loves to blame those who are most vulnerable. Let's blame the folks in jail. I mean, didn't they commit the crime? I mean, sure, there are a few people that are innocent, but for the most part, they did it. They're guilty, right? Let's blame Trayvon Martin, right? I mean, after all, he was out wearing a hoodie at night with candy and soda, looking like he was up to no good. Let's blame victims of domestic violence. It's Super Bowl day, and did you guys know statistically that the most DV, DV, domestic violence cases, get reported on this day, Super Bowl day? 
but let's blame them because why do they stay in such horrible situations? They can leave. We even now have a word for this phenomena. It's called victim blaming, which refers to assigning fault to people who experience violence or wrongdoing and is used as a tool to discredit people of marginalized groups who speak out against microaggressions or any injustice. Well, today in the text, we can say, thank the Jesus. Jesus is coming with a whole different mindset. Aren't you glad we have a radical Jesus who loves those who are oppressed, who loves us in a radically different way? He says, for starters, in this text, you are blessed. On this particular day, Jesus stands before a large crowd. There were lots of people from Judea and lots of people from Jerusalem and even some people from Tyre and Sidon. They wanted this thing or that and saw Jesus as a means to an end to their pain and suffering. They were even trying to touch him because healing came out of them. And he declares a different reality about them other than the one they hear in the daily grind. I need you to hear me. You are blessed. Baby Suggs in the book Beloved also tries to speak this message of love to those who have endured slavery, to those who have been called everything except a child of God, a message of love. And she says these words to the slaves gathered in the woods. In this here place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it, love it hard. Cause yonder, they don't love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they flay it. And oh, my people, they don't love your hands. Love your hands. Love them, raise them up, kiss them, touch others with them, pat them together, stroke them on your face, because they don't love that either. You see, you got to love it. Love it love you hard. She invites those for which the world had little regard for to love themselves, to deem themselves worthy of love. She continues Jesus' tradition of speaking to those who need to hear, speaking to those who need healing, who need to know they are more than okay, just as they are loved to the bone. Jesus lavishes blessings on struggling humanity. Baby Sug lavishes kindness on people who are struggling. We can extend this gesture to strangers, literally, to those who might be running a little low, like the lady who uses expensive perfume to put on Jesus' feet. Imagine someone feeling like sugar, honey, iced tea and being told how wonderful how wonderful they are. Remember Deshonda from last week who suffered low self-esteem being told she was beauty pageant material. I imagine Jesus as a compassion starter. Imagine where others judge you. Jesus says, stop. Are you without imperfection? Go and live your best life. You are blessed. I have a gas stove. How many of you have gas stoves? Just checking in. How many have electric? So I grew up with an electric stove, and then I went away to graduate school here in Chicago and got a gas stove. Now they've improved gas stoves a lot because some of them you can just turn and it goes click, 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 and it lights up. But I live in a house where you have to actually light the stove for it to start. I was reminded of this two weeks ago because that thing happened where my lighter ran out of fluid. So it's dinner time and imagine, I need a lighter to light the stove and I've run out of fluid and the backup fluid is missing. How do I light the stove? So I'm looking around the house hoping I can find mysterious, magical 
uh, you know, what am I trying to say? Matches. Hold on a minute. And so I, I don't find them, but thanks to the pop-up picnic, I find this. Now you guys know what this is. It's not easy. It's not like a lighter. And it, to me, it's not even easy as matches. Cause like, I don't know, maybe cigarette smokers, you know the trick, but you know, you can get your finger burnt when you're trying to do this. But when you have no lighter fluid, this is a beautiful thing, right? And so when you use this, you need this for a gas stove to get it started. And this is what I imagine about compassion. Compassion starters is like getting love started. And so compassion is to love what matches what this is to a fire. Compassion helps love to flow more freely. The ability to show concern for another person's plight in life starts with something. The ability to dis demonstrate understanding for an experience you have not personally had. Sometimes people will talk to you about something you've just never been through in your life. To meet someone where they are in their time of need, it starts something. To show empathy for someone else who is going through, it starts something. I remember Joe Yokely, and whenever I would ask Joe, how was he, do was do how was he doing, Joe would always say the same thing back to me. He would say, do you really want to know? He said, you know, a lot of people ask me, how are you doing? But they don't really want to know. And I said, Joe, yes, I really want to know. And then Joe would really go into how he was doing. A friend of mine from another country who was born in another country but came to live here said that he learned early on Americans ask you how you are doing, but they don't really mean it. And he said, it took me a minute because when people in my country ask you how you are doing, it really is a deeper question. Compassion says, I'm asking you this question and I really care and want to know how you're doing. I want to enter right where you are. Compassion ignites the fire in each of us. Jesus was a compassion starter. He knew how to connect and relate to people. I kind of envy him. And they came from Judea, and they came from Jerusalem, and Sidon, and Tyre. They came from all over because Jesus' message was gold. It was everything. And you see, the religious people hadn't been saying it. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who cry. Blessed are those who are not like. Blessed are those who are bullied. Let me tell you all, you are blessed. Jesus extends a hand to anyone who has felt left out didn't get the invitation to a party, to those who suffer from cruelty and meanness. Blessed are you who are struggling. I see you. Blessed are those with the hoodie wearing. Blessed are the baggy pants youth. Blessed are the kids that are throwing parties. Blessed are the kids who stole God. Blessed are our youth who are meeting in a space upstairs for the first time in two years. Blessed are they, and blessed, blessed are you. What makes compassion special is it's not always the first thing that comes to mind to do. But when we can be compassionate toward another, it's a fire starter to love. A few years ago, a family got invited to a friend's birthday party in Las Vegas. You know, more and more now, people are doing birthday parties in destination spots. It's like, no more, come over your house. Let's go to Bermuda. Let's go, let's go to Hawaii. So this guy was doing like a big birthday party, and he invited his friends to Las Vegas. And so when the mom discussed it with her three daughters, the oldest, 17 years old, stated, Mom, I can't go. This is competition play week. I have to be here. And so her parents had a discussion and they talked it over and they said, well, she's very responsible. We trust her. I mean, when we have her do things with her younger siblings, she always does it. And we trust her. And so they made this decision 
Keep this on mind. They made this decision to leave their 17-year-old daughter behind while they go to Las Vegas. So they went to Las Vegas. They had a good time with the two other kids, and they returned home that Sunday evening. The house was still standing, thank the Jesus, and things looked in place. That was Sunday evening. And then Monday comes, and the kids go off to school, and the mom is down in the basement, and she finds a piece of paper with her daughter's writing on it, a list of things that her daughter had written down that she needed to move back after the party. None of these things had actually been moved back. And so the mom thinks, let me call my husband because, you know, I'm about to ground this girl. So she gets on the phone with her husband and she said, do you know this girl had the nerve to have a party? We trusted her while we were away. And the husband says, what, what do you guys think the husband said? He says, baby, you know what? The house is still standing. The house looks good. She cleaned it up. Let's let her think that she got away with it. And so they decide that they're not going to tell her that they know she threw a party. That's Monday. And then Tuesday comes, and the daughter comes home upset, upset. And she says to her mom, we need to talk. And the mom says, okay, hon, what do we need to talk about? And the daughter explains to her, I'm in trouble at school. I'm in trouble at school, and now they're kicking me off the honor society because I was drinking at a party. Now, you guys know where this is going a little bit. <laughs> the mom looks at her like, because she's not supposed to know the party was at her house, and says, well, hon, where were you at a party? <laughs> the daughter confesses, mom, I had a party at the house. And so, like, her mom is, like, really sad. You know, typical mom wants to light into her, but this daughter has now gotten kicking off the honor society. She has gotten trouble at school. And the daughter says, mom, they're giving me a chance to appeal this case and I need a character witness and I want that to be you. Now the mom looks at her and say, are you sure? <laughs> are you really sure you want me to be your character witness? And the girl's like, yes, mom, I want you to go. And so. She goes with the girl to school. She listens to what the school has to say, and she listens to her daughter speak. And then as she is sitting there, because clearly her daughter's in trouble, and clearly the blame belongs to her daughter, and clearly her daughter shouldn't have had a party at the house. She's sitting there, and as she sits there, she begins to enter into a little bit of compassion, and she begins to think, what parent in their right mind would leave their daughter at home on a weekend and trust her to do the right thing. She begins to think to herself, <clears throat> my daughter's not the only one that is wrong here. And so when they turn to her and say, mom, is there anything you would like to say on behalf of your daughter? She says these words, Meredith is a good person. Meredith is honorable. Meredith is smart. She's smart enough to be in the honor society. She's a giving and generous person. She is kind to her sisters. And she did not turn in all the other honor society kids that were at the party. She made a mistake, and I think she learned from it. And do you think they changed their decision? No. <laughs> she was still kicked out of the honor society, and nothing changed. But the mom feels like something did change. Blessed are the party goers, for they shall have a good time. <laughs> no, that's not my point right now. Seriously. <laughs> Consider your invitation to start fires. The mom says for her, she welcomed the opportunity because she got the chance to articulate and say things about her daughter that her daughter had never heard and that she doesn't ever think she would have just said those words to her daughter. And so for her, the opportunity just to affirm and say, hey, in spite of your mistakes, you're a good person. That's what compassion is all about. You are not the total of any one decision that you have made. You're not the total of any two, three, or four decisions you have made. I'm inviting you guys to be compassion starters. I know we've heard of fire starters and oftentimes it's looked at in a derogatory kind of way. 
but let us be fire starters. Let us ignite love in others. Let us, when the first temptation is to lay someone out, find that door that leads to compassion. Let us bless someone. Let us demonstrate compassion for someone else's journey. Let us find a way, even if we get a little burnt, to ignite the fire. Today, this second part of Love Challenge, we heard the famous Beatitudes. A few years back, I heard another rendition of them, and I'd like to end here today with Nadia Bowles Weber. Blessed are the agnostics. Blessed are those who doubt, those who aren't sure, who can still be surprised. Blessed are they who are spiritually impoverished and therefore not so certain about everything that they no longer take in new information. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are the preschoolers who cut in line at communion. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are they who have buried their loved ones, for whom tears could fill an ocean. Blessed are they who have loved enough to know what loss feels like. Blessed are the mothers of miscarried. Blessed are they who don't have the luxury of taking things for granted anymore. Blessed are they who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for somebody else for everybody else around them. Blessed are those who still aren't over it yet. Blessed are those who mourn. You are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are those who no one else notices. The kid who sits alone at middle school lunch table, the laundry guys at the hospital, the sex workers and the night shift street sweepers, Blessed are the forgotten. Blessed are the closeted. Blessed are the unemployed. Blessed are the unimpressive and the underrepresented. Blessed are the teens who have to figure out ways to hide the new cuts on their arms. Blessed are the meek. You are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are the wrongly accused, the ones who never catch a break, the ones for whom life is hard, for Jesus chose to surround himself with people just like them. Blessed are those without documentation. Blessed are those who have no one to lobby for them. Blessed are the foster kids and special ed kids and every other kid who just wants to feel safe and loved. Blessed are those who make terrible business decisions for the sake of people. Blessed are the born, burned out social workers and the overworked teachers dealing with COVID and the pro bono case takers. Blessed are the kids who step between the bullies and the weak. Blessed are they who hear that they are forgiven. Blessed is everyone who has ever forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. Blessed are the merciful, for they totally get it. Let us continue this tradition of blessing people, of loving people, of exhibiting compassion, and of starting fires. Amen.